Hello, my name is Todd Klutz, and I work for Yahoo specifically on uh, the Yahoo User Interface Library. And today I'm here to talk about architecting an accessible web, uh, web 2.0 widget framework. And the YUI library is currently in a state of transition. We're in the middle of building YUI 3. And so the current version of YUI is YUI 2. And that's a library that really has evolved over time. And as a result, um, the widgets in the YUI 2 uh, library don't share a common architecture. Um, and while we do have some accessibility features across the library, not all widgets um, have accessibility taken into consideration from the very start. And so we've used YUI 3 as an opportunity to really take a fresh look at the library, uh, develop both a common widget architecture, but also take accessibility into consideration from the very, very beginning and build that into the foundation of our widget library. Uh, one of the other interesting things about YUI 2 is although it's um, evolved over time, this has resulted in somewhat of a consistent API, but this has also allowed some of our very best ideas to bubble to the top, and so we've been able to take those ideas with regard to accessibility and migrate those over into YUI 3. So while we're in this transition, I think that this um, talk might more appropriately be labeled lessons learned while architecting an accessible uh, web 2.0 widget framework. And the first lesson we've learned while uh, working on accessibility in YUI 3 is that it's really important to build on existing best practices. And what I mean by that is that we don't want to exclusively uh, rely on the latest technologies as the sole means of making a widget accessible. And to paint a clearer picture of what that means, you know, one, one of the very latest technologies with respect to accessibility is the ARIA specification. And that specification has been implemented in the latest versions of all of the A-grade browsers. Um, and while each of those latest versions of the browsers has support for ARIA, um, what we found at Yahoo is there's actually a significant number of our users, approximately about 60%, who are using browsers that actually don't have support for ARIA, namely IE6 and IE7. And when you take that into consideration, and you also consider a recent um, study done by the Passiello group regarding ARIA support and all the, uh, the latest versions of every browser, their findings indicate that um, while the latest versions of all the browsers have support for ARIA, the degree to which ARIA is supported in those browsers is very inconsistent. And not only is support for ARIA inconsistent in each of the browsers, it's also actually inconsistent um, in each of the screen readers. So um, on the Code Talks wiki, for example, for a given ARIA role or state, you can look up um, and see how that role is supported in each of the um, major screen readers. And so when you take all that into consideration and you also consider a recent study done by WebAIM considering, concerning the uh, preferences of users of screen readers. Although most users of screen readers actually update to the latest version uh, within the first year of its release, a significant percentage, about 25%, are actually still on older versions, versions that might be three years old, which might mean versions of screen readers that actually don't have support for ARIA. So to sum up, Many users have older browsers and older screen readers, and so it's really important that when we're considering accessibility that we um, layer in our support for accessibility as, a, as opposed to relying exclusively on the latest versions of technologies such as ARIA. And so for YUI3, what this has meant is that we've really made progressive enhancement one of the guiding principles of our widget uh, framework design to account for this. And so, that's the first lesson we've learned, is that build on, building on best practices is really critical. I'd like to introduce the next lesson I, that we've learned while developing YUI3 with a video excerpt from a talk that uh, Douglas Crockford gave here at Yahoo a couple of years ago. Douglas is, of course, the uh, principal JavaScript architect at Yahoo, and he gave a talk titled The Theory of the DOM and Inconvenient API. And so I'll play the excerpt of that talk for you now. When I started doing the classes in JavaScript, a lot of people came to me afterwards and said, we really like the information about JavaScript, but you didn't say anything about the browser, and the browser is where we spend most of our time, so could you do something about that? And I thought about that for a long time because, you know, what is the browser? The browser is a, a vast source of incompatibility, pain, and misery. 
So the browser is a vast source of incompatibility, pain, and misery, and that's really what I'd like to title the second lesson. And to underscore that point, I'd like to reference uh, a blog entry actually written by Eric Moralia titled 672 Things. And in this blog entry, Eric um, theorizes that for uh, web developers, um, when you're developing an application or site for the web, there are approximately 672 things that you have to take into consideration. And he arrives at that number by saying, first, there are several different knowledge areas that an individual front-end engineer needs to be familiar with. Uh, for example, HTML. And each one of those knowledge areas is actually subject to four dimensions. There's the specification. There's the implementation of that specification in the browsers. That implementation um, inevitably always has defects. And so the community of developers ends up coming up with theories and practices for working around those defects. And of course, there isn't just one knowledge area. There are many. Everything from the DOM to CSS to JavaScript to the various data transport mechanisms in the browser. And there, of course, are multiple platforms to consider from uh, the Mac to Linux. And each of those platforms has multiple browsers available for it. And so the numbers tally up such as this, seven different knowledge areas, four dimensions each, approximately three platforms, multiple browsers per pl platform. And then not to, re not to forget that um, every browser has two rendering modes, both a quirks mode and a standards mode. And so that's how you arrive at this number, 672. And of course, this is without even considering um, accessibility as one of the knowledge areas. And so when you add accessibility to this equation, you arrive at a number uh, much greater than 672. And when you consider the accessibility knowledge area, and you just consider, for example, one slice of that, which would be ARIA, it, of course, is subject to the same four dimensions that um, Eric talks about in his article. The specification, the implementation, uh, defects, theory and practice. And so to summarize, you know, if DHML development is difficult enough, Accessible DHML development is even more so. And I'd like to underscore that point with a quick example. When I set out to incorporate ARIA into the YUI menu, um, of course, I read the spec, and I had designed my menu with um, good semantic markup. And because it was a navigational menu, um, it was a set of uh, unord uh, unordered lists that were nested um, using anchor elements. And then after using the good semantic markup and adding uh, support for the keyboard via JavaScript, I then layered in uh, support for the ARIA roles and states, um, started up Firefox, started up um, JAWS, uh, one of the leading screen readers for Windows, and uh, tested it out. And this is a quick screencast of what that experience was like. Tab menu bar home http colon slash slash connect sub menu http colon slash slash developer dot yahoo menu connect menu developer network http colon slash slash developer flicker http colon slash slash double jump cut http colon slash slash pim sub menu http colon profiles http colon slash slash profile escape menu bar so as you can see from the screencast and hear from, hear from the uh, audio portion of the screencast, um, although I had um, used really good semantic markup, um, the semantics of HTML were actually uh, superseding the semantics that I had layered in via progressive enhancement. So the, uh, the semantics of ARIA, rather, were being superseded by the semantics of HTML, which was not the experience I would have expected. Um, so rather than the screen reader actually um, telling me that each anchor element was a menu item, which was the role I had applied to each anchor. It was still um, announcing each anchor as what it was natively in HTML, an anchor element, by reading its href attribute. Um, and so I decided to test this in another browser uh, with an, uh, another screen reader. So I started up um, IE8, and I, and I started up um, Window Eyes, and this was the result I got. Home, connect pull down, developer network, flicker, jump cut, pimp pull down, profiles, mobile, menu, connect. So what I found was that the user experience, depending on the screen reader you were using, was actually quite different. It seemed as though window eyes actually got the implementation uh, that was more in line with my expectation, which was that the 
the, uh, the semantics that I had applied via ARIA actually had superseded those of HTML. And so my findings were that when you're designing for progressive enhancement with respect to accessibility, sometimes um, best practices can cause some collisions, which was the case in my menu. Um, and the point of the two screencasts wasn't necessarily to point out deficiencies in JAWS, for example, and highlight window eyes as being a superior screen reader because they both have their strengths. Um, and all, after all, because the ARIA spec is still evolving, bugs are to be expected re with regard to implementations in browsers and screen readers. But at what I found really frustrating as a developer was that um, it's really difficult and sometimes impossible to work around these deficiencies or bugs because as a developer um, in the browser space, you actually are not able to detect any assistive technology running in the browsers. And so I found myself in this landscape where there, I was addressing familiar types of problems. Um, incompatibilities and inconsistencies are very familiar to any front-end engineer. But unfortunately, I had no good solutions at my disposal because, again, I can't detect assistive technology, and therefore I can't make the user experience better for users of one assistive technology um, or the other. And again, DHML classically is a very mutable set of technologies, and so uh, front-end engineers are very used to being able to, for example, um, do some browser detection and either fix bugs in a given browser or supplement uh, functionality that's um, missing in one browser and is not, and missing in one browser but is not, but is available in another browser. In the accessibility space, we're unfortunately not able to do that, and so our hands are tied in a lot of situations. And so going back to sort of the state of ARIA uh, support, um, what I found is that support for ARIA uh, is still evolving. Um, the implementations are incomplete and inconsistent between browsers and screen readers. Um, and a lot of that is because it's unclear how things are supposed to work, both to the developers who are writing code for the browser, as well as the developers who are actually designing um, the feature set in screen readers, because there just aren't enough um, practical examples on the web using ARIA for them to really get a sense of what um, these technologies are supposed to do. Um, this is made even more difficult by the fact that ARIA support is not documented well by browsers or screen reader uh, manufacturers. So a lot of third parties have actually taken it on themselves to do this documentation. As I noted earlier, the Passiello group has done a really great job of identifying um, the differences between ARIA support across browser and the Code Talks Wiki has really good support for uh, documentation regarding um, how ARIA support differs across various screen readers. And so this is what we've got, but I, I really think that this is where we need to be, which is, you know, if you take uh, um, Opera's um, documentation on their CSS support, for example, they have these really good compatibility tables which um, detail very explicitly what CSS um, properties they support. And we, really, we, we as developers really need this from both the browser manufacturers and the screen reader manufacturers if we're to make really informed decisions about um, what degree of ARIA support we're going to build into our applications and widgets. We also really need from um, AT vendors the ability to detect whether they're present. Typically the argument for um, not needing to detect assistive technology is that you shouldn't be um, building in any functionality exclusively for accessibility because um, any functionality you add for accessibility actually benefits everyone, whether they're a disabled user or not. And a perfect example of that would be adding keyboard support to a widget. Um, that's something that's beneficial to any type of user. Um, but I think that the need for AT detection actually goes beyond that. Um, as I noted earlier, there are enough um, inconsistencies and incompatibilities between um, ARIA implementations and browsers that if we as developers had the ability to detect AT, we could supplement missing functionality or make better decisions on the fly as to whether or not to use it. Um, and we could also deliver AT-specific features in the interest of, of performance. We know on the web that every byte counts. And so if we know, for example, that the user is using a screen reader, we could leverage certain parts of the ARIA specification that are very, specific, very specifically beneficial to users of screen readers like for example, live regions, where you're able to actually speak text back to the user. That type of functionality might 
you know, not necessarily be beneficial for all users. It might be actually beneficial for very uh, specific types. So the other use case for um, AT detection is the ability to um, target specific types of users and deliver functionality that is beneficial only to them. And if you consider ARIA Live Reads as, as an example of that, where um, this is a piece of the ARIA spec that is designed specifically to allow developers to um, speak text back to the user. Um, this might only be beneficial, for example, for users of screen readers. So it would be valuable in the interest of performance to only send those bytes over the wire if that is the type of user who is actually interacting with this application. So to sum up, um, support for accessibility adds significantly to the number of to the number of things that an individual front end engineer needs to think about. Um, bugs exist, for example, in the ARIA specification, and workarounds are sometimes necessary and difficult or impossible to do. Um, developers who are interested in accessibility really need better documentation from both the browsers and the assistive tech uh, technology companies. And I think that developers really need the ability to detect assistive technology via JavaScript. And one of the things that I think is the mission of YUI3 is, you know, we our mission has always been to help reduce the number of things that developers have to think about. And so in the accessibility space, um, this holds true, of course, even more so. And so our, our aim is to try to build as much um, into our widget, uh, widget infrastructure and our uh, utilities as, as we can so that developers can focus on the bigger picture. And so that is the second lesson we've learned. The third lesson we've learned is that testing is critical, but it's also really, really difficult when it comes to accessibility. Um, testing, of course, is critical here at Yahoo because at Yahoo, users are our customers. And so we need to take accessibility really ser seriously. But it's also necessary to clearly define what support means. And so far, we've addressed support, um, for example, in the browser space via our Graded Browser Support strategy. Graded Browser Support has allowed us to not only identify those browsers that represent statistically the most likely uh, visitors to Yahoo, but if those browsers that if we test against them, we're probably covering most of the meaningful browsers on the web. And if we try to extend the Graded Browser Support model to screen readers, it actually becomes quite difficult uh, really quickly because um, not every version of every screen reader supports every browser. For example, JAWS is limited their support to Firefox and Internet Explorer, as has Window Eyes. VoiceOver on the Mac supports Safari, obviously, and I believe has support for Opera. And then on Orca for Linux, you have support for Firefox. Um, and this is really complicated also because not, like I said earlier, not every version of every screen reader has support for ARIA, and not every web browser has a for ARIA as an example. And so the testing challenge has become which browsers are you going to test when, you, when you're considering accessibility and which browser versions uh, along with which screen readers and which screen reader versions. And so coming up with these combinations could result in a very large testing matrix which would make it really difficult to test against. Um, the other question is how we're actually going to define support for accessibility. Or when we say it's accessible, does that mean that it's accessible only via uh, the use of ARIA? Or are we going to be testing our support for ARIA as well as um, the fallbacks that we've put in place using existing best, practice, best practices for accessibility as well as other accessible hacks? Um, and are we going to be testing in both uh, modes of the stream reader? We're going to be testing in uh, the stream reader with a virtual buffer and uh, on and off. The other question, of course, that comes to mind with respect to testing is, are we going to be doing manual testing, unit testing, and automated testing? Um, you know, what is really the most practical for us? We know for sure that manual testing provides the most insights with respect to accessibility, but we also know that uh, unit testing and automated testing are also necessary. And of course, testing is ultimately important because we don't want to be in the business of supporting browsers and we don't want to be in the business of supporting assistive technology. We want to be in the business of supporting users. And so to sum up on this point, testing is critical. Um, it's more time consuming um, than just standard browser support because of the complicated matrix of browsers and screen readers, as an example. Um, that 
there are a tremendous number of insights that can be gained from manual testing, and then that's absolutely necessary. Um, and because uh, the matrix of support is difficult, it also makes filing bugs really difficult. Again, because we don't have good documentation regarding um, the level of ARIA support in screen readers or browsers, when we do, as developers, find a bug in our ARIA support, we don't necessarily know who to file that bug with, which, you know, so as a really conscientious, conscientious developer, you'll probably end up filing a bug in multiple places, but that's, again, time consuming. So if, if the more information we as developers have, the more we can contribute back to the both browsers and the assistive technology vendors in a more efficient manner regarding um, how to fix bugs. And so how this impacts YUI3 is that we're working really hard to de figure out how we can define A-grade support for browsers and screen reader combinations. And this is something that we haven't really settled on the answer for, but we know it's something that we need to figure out and we're working actively towards. We also need to find a really practical way to ensure support for accessibility, because ultimately, of course, the goal is to train our users, um, all of our users, to expect more, not less, of the web. The fourth lesson that we've learned while developing uh, an accessible uh, widget framework is that new skills are required that a lot of developers actually don't already have. So um, the ARIA specification, for example, provides um, a lot of guidance with regard to the development of accessible widgets, as does the corresponding ARIA best practices document. And as a developer, if you follow those, uh, if you follow that guidance to the letter, you'll come up with a widget that probably works but it won't be necessarily be usable. And that's a pretty big distinction. There's a big difference between it working and being usable. And to go from it working to being usable, how do we get there? How do we improve the usability of our widgets with respect to accessibility? Well, the first thing we need to do as developers is to learn new skills. And so for me, that meant actually learning how to use a screen reader. And um, as a as a developer who's interested in helping other developers also learn how to use assistive technology, I'd like to point you to at least two resources to start. And one, and this is a little self-promotional, is my own uh, YY blog entry on configuring your machine for testing with a screen reader. And the other is a blog entry that was recently authored by Marco Zehi on how to test um, for accessibility using the NVDA screen reader, which is a free screen reader, uh, open source. Um, and the Firefox web browser. And so I think both of these are really good resources for developers who are looking to learn about assistive technology to learn how to make their widgets more usable. And the second thing, of course, we can do as developers is to actually do user testing. And what I have found is that that feedback loop between developers and the users that you're targeting with respect to accessibility is really, really important because there are insights that you can gain into how something works um, when you're actually testing with someone who uses assistive technology that you could have never have learned on your own. And that's simply because these are people that use this technology every single day and they're gonna have insights that you would never have. And so that user testing is really, really valuable. And so to sum up, reading documentation and following directions only gets you so far. Um, it's really when you take that next step and you learn how to use AT and you do user testing that you really gain the valuable insights that take you from something working to something being usable. And so for YUI3, this is another thing that we really feel is our mission, is that um, this developer education, both internally and externally, is really important. And we also realize that not every developer has the resources that we at Yahoo have with regard to testing. And so that's one of the values that uh, YUI3 can bring to developers, is that we can do a lot of usability testing on our widgets internally and provide that value back to anyone who is consuming our widgets. The next lesson we've learned is that living up to the desktop is really difficult. And so before the ARIA specification came into uh, came to be supported in each of the major web browsers, most users of screen readers actually interacted with um, a web page or web application um, via this concept of the virtual buffer. And what the virtual buffer essentially 
does is it, it acts as sort of a proxy um, between the user and the web page or web application. And what it does is essentially takes a snapshot of that web page in time and it maps a set of keyboard shortcuts to it that the user can use to interact with the page. And as an example of that, um, for, you could press, for example, the H key to quickly navigate between all the headings on a page, the L key to quickly navigate between all the, the lists on a page. And while the interaction model provided by screener, screen readers can be considered perhaps rather limiting in this respect, the real advantage that this has is it's very, very consistent from one web page or web application to another because, again, um, the user isn't interacting with the page directly. They're interacting with a snapshot of the page in time as provided uh, by the virtual buffer, and all the keyboard shortcuts provided are, again, provided by the screen reader, not by the page, because the virtual buffer uh, essentially intercepts all events on the page and is uh, providing all the keyboard shortcuts to the user directly. ARIA changes this interaction model um, because it requires the virtual buffer be toggled off in order for the user to interact with, with the page. And so when you implement a widget that has support for ARIA, uh, you as a developer, uh, it's your responsibility to actually add support for all of the uh, keyboard interaction. And so with the virtual buffer off, the user is actually interacting with the page directly. Um, and although this provides um, a, a huge opportunity for um, more rich interaction from the user standpoint, it also puts a tremendous amount of responsibility on the developer to get it right. So that responsibility that was previously centralized to a, a, a limited set of screen reader manufacturers, for example, has now been decentralized to allow different developers who all might have um, various levels of experience um, writing accessible widgets. So the challenge is, is there's a tremendous number of little details when it comes to accessibility to get right. And we, again, we want to train the user to expect more, not less, from the web. And so the onus of responsibility really is now on the developers, and that's why it's so important for developers to learn how to use assistive technology when they're um, creating uh, widgets. So again, ARIA puts more responsibility on developers. There's lots of little details to get right, so it's really important to read the ARIA specification, to study the desktop interaction model, for example, to do user testing, to use, learn how to use assistive technology, because again, we, we only have so many uh, chances to get this right. We want to try to um, train users to expect more from the web, not less. And again, this is where we consider uh, YUI3 is really uh, having an opportunity to get this right, is if we can help offload some of that um, responsibility from um, all the developers out there, all the you know, millions of de developers out in the world, and because we have the resources to do testing to build in support for keyboard, for example, to our, to our widgets out of the box, we can um, add value to developers by helping shoulder that responsibility, not necessarily putting all the responsibility on so many people to get it right. The sixth lesson we've learned um, is that web is not the desktop. And I'd like to begin this segment with, with another video clip um, by Douglas Crockford. Um, and this is from the, the same talk. There is something really amazing about the web that despite all of its deep problems, it's actually been a very, very effective interactive communications medium. So although the web wasn't necessarily designed as an application delivery platform, it's been really successful at that. And um, that success has actually brought new challenges. And so the web obviously has the abilities um, and has, has succeeded where the desktop hasn't in, um, in regard to the write once, run anywhere model. But it also has a lot of constraints such as performance, security, and accessibility. And when you consider, for example, um, ARIA, ARIA allows you to... In enhance the semantics of a widget so that um, users no longer see um, elements as native HTML elements, but as the um, widgets that you're actually um, describing them to be. So for example, it allows you to transform an unordered list into a menu so that um, users of screen readers um, hear uh, menu item and menu roles as they're navigating through the menu as opposed to 
hearing it as a list. It's perfectly reasonable to expect that when you um, use the ARIA roles and states to mark up a widget, that the user is going to expect that the widget running in that browser is going to behave exactly like it does on that native platform. So a tab view that they encounter on uh, Firefox running on GNOME is, is going to perform exactly like it would on that native desktop. Um, but of course, the challenge here is that we, as web developers, provide these applications that run um, cross-browser, cross-platform. And so we can't guarantee that um, experience is going to be actually identical for each user of each different uh, desktop environment. And so when you're developing your widgets, what you really need to consider is not necessarily uh, what desktop am I going to mimic, but what is really best for the web. And this was the case, for example, when we sat down to do the uh, tab view plugin for our, the, the this, this was the case when we sat down to develop our ARIA plugin for our tab view widget. You know, when we were developing that, the first thing we took into consideration well, was, do we want to mimic Mac or Windows? And um, there are two very in different interaction models for a tab view. On Windows, when the tab list has focus, pressing the arrow key immediately loads the panel for that tab. Whereas on um, the Mac, when you are focused on an individual tab in a tab list, it isn't until you actually click on that tab that the tab content gets loaded. And as it turns out, the Mac's model for the keyboard interaction actually works a lot better for the web when you consider that um, a tab view's content might be loaded asynchronously, and you don't necessarily want to be firing off a lot of different requests for content just because the user is arrowing through the tab list to figure out which tab they want to load. Uh, to load. And so the, the lesson learned was to not necessarily mimic a given desktop, but try to find those patterns on an individual widget basis that actually work best for that widget and work best for that widget um, in the context of the web, not the desktop. And so here's a quick, here's a quick example, a quick screencast of what the uh, YUI tab view sounds like when it's using the ARIA roles and states. Tab control, press the space bar or enter key to load the content of each tab. Opera tab selected one of four. Firefox tab selected two of four. Explorer tab selected three of four. Please wait. Content loading for Explorer property page. Content loaded for Explorer property page. Explorer property page list. Microsoft becomes official Apache sponsor. Linkage recent original stories. Linkage sling page announces full support for Firefox linkage. The other thing to take into consideration is that because the content of every tab could be loaded asynchronously, we needed to notify users of screen readers that that content was in the process of being loaded. And for that, we used the ARIA Live regions. And so that's another challenge that is different from developing on the desktop, which is that you know, because so much might be loaded on the fly, you need to uh, alert the user to the fact that this content is loading asynchronously and let them know when it's OK to proceed with actually interacting with a given portion of a widget's functionality. So, um, the, interaction, the interaction model for web-based widgets has a lot of nuances that are important to take into consideration, and so um, it's important to not exactly consider the desktop as a holy grail when developing widgets. The other challenge that um, ARIA presents with respect to um, browser development is that um, there's a lot of examples of things on the web that are not wholly documents or wholly applications or wholly applications. Um, take, for example, the Yahoo homepage. The Yahoo homepage is littered with um, tons of different widgets, tab views, um, autocompletes, um, and, for example, little applications for being able to read your uh, mail or sign into Yahoo Messenger. And so how do you classify this page? Is it really, it, it's somewhat a document from, from the standpoint of it's got a lot of just straight up content, but it also has a lot of application-like functionality. And so how to you know, present this concept to a user of a screen reader, I think, is really challenging because, again, um, when you consider the, the standard way in which users of screen readers are used to interacting with a page through this concept of the virtual buffer where um, they have uh, a set of keyboard shortcuts that are mapped to different pieces of content. Um, and again, with the virtual buffer on, the ARIA roles and states don't work. And so, 
um, you know, if they come to the Yahoo homepage, they, there would be a certain advantage to them of being able to navigate this, you know, document through this keyboard shortcuts provided by the virtual buffer. Um, but in order to use ARIA, what we really need to do is encourage these users to toggle the virtual buffer off, which means they're going to find themselves in this space where they're in the scope of a, a document for which the virtual buffer would actually be useful, but they also need the virtual buffer off in order to interact with the widgets on the page. So a lot of this is going to require some user education from the standpoint of learning how to use and how to and what to expect with regard to this hybrid model because this is this at this um, model of development is so pervasive across the web from you know the Yahoo homepage to Facebook for example the other challenge that aria presents is this notion of what is the right role you know what are the right semantics to provide for for given widgets there's the web is full of examples of widgets that aren't really common on the desktop, for example, an accordion view. And there is no um, corresponding ARIA role for an accordion. And so you find yourself in this familiar circumstance of trying to find what is the best semantics, but aren't the 100% um, most accurate semantics. And so depending on the use case of your, or depending on how your accordion view has been structured, for example, it might be more accurately described as an ARIA tree view or perhaps an ARIA tab view. And these are the kinds of decisions that developers are currently faced with considering the current state of the ARIA spec. And so to sum up, it seems like the, the specs in some ways are always kind of behind what is happening on the web. Again, there are a lot of widgets on, on the web that um, don't exist on the desktop, and so there is no ARIA support for those. And so developers have to make um, their best decision with regard to ARIA usage with respect to those types of widgets. Um, I think that from the standpoint of a following um, design patterns, it's best to really borrow from the desktop as regarding your interaction models as opposed to completely trying to mimic the desktop when you're doing widget development because um, Again, the desktop really isn't the holy grail. It's it's the the web is, is has got uh, a ubiquity to it that the desktop has never been able to achieve. And not only that, um, for many users, especially um, younger users, their first experience with a lot of applications is actually going to be web applications, not desktop applications. And so we need to really embrace how the web is different and create solutions that are unique and right for the web, rather than um, trying to chase the desktop. And the other challenge that the browser has that the desktop doesn't necessarily have is this challenge of performance. And this impacts accessibility because um, obviously the more code on the page you have, the, no, the more you're going to slow down initial load time and render time um, in the browser. Um, but of course, the challenge is that accessibility features like ARIA support require more code. For example, keyboard support and manage of, management of the ARIA roles and states. And so, the challenge becomes how to be both feature rich and fast at the same time. One uh, solution for how to be both uh, fast and feature rich at the same time was proposed by Joseph Smarr, who is the chief platform architect at uh, Plaxo. And he came to Yahoo several years ago and gave a talk on performance. And one of the insights he offered was to be lazy because nothing is faster than doing nothing. And you know the thing about laziness, the reason why it's so important for all kinds of uh, optimization work is that um, if you can get away with not doing something now, you know, worst case, you'll have to do it later, but you may not have to ever do it at all. And so how does this concept of laziness play out, for example, in, in using the example of a web application? Well, here's a screenshot of Yahoo Mail. And as you can see, there's tons of various small widgets on this page, tons of interaction points that the user actually might interact with. But the thing is, um, if we were to actually front load this widget with all this functionality to start, um, you would have significant um, challenges with respect to making this application performant. And so what, what we really need to do is consider how we can be as lazy as possible with um, uh, functionality that is delivering uh, accessibility specific features so that, for example, we might not load the ARIA keyboard support for a toolbar until that toolbar receives initial focus. And so this 
goal of being able to support um, laziness as a road to furthering accessibility is really at the heart of our development of YUI3 because we're trying to develop a much more mar uh, develop a much more modular widget architecture so that we can have some core functionality that the, the, the widget can have on the page to start and then we can layer in functionality on the fly such as keyboard support or ARIA support as needed. That way we can speed up initial page load, speed up initial render time without having to make sacrifices necessarily for accessibility. And so this concept of a modular widget architecture, just to sum up, not only helps us be lazier in the uh, interest of improving performance, but it also gives our developers um, the flexibility of uh, enhancing widgets with functionality on the fly, as well as um, encouraging innovation. And so there's lots of research going into how to both find the right interaction model for our widgets as well as how we can create our uh, widget infrastructure to both balance performance with accessibility. The seventh lesson we've learned while um, developing YUI3 is that widget frameworks can't do it all. So the web is full of examples of widgets that aren't necessarily directly mapped to specific things on the desktop. And if you take, for example, this screenshot of the navigation from Yahoo's um, OMG site, which is our celebrity gossip site, the primary navigation for this is somewhat a tab view, a menu bar, and split buttons all in one. And so the challenge becomes when you're, you know, if, if you want to enhance the semantics of this UI control through ARIA is which thing do you choose? And so, um, you know, the other challenge is from a widget development standpoint, um, you know, is this a widget that we want to offer from YUI3 out of the box? Probably not. And um, because there's always going to be needs for new style of widget development because developers like coming up with new things, visual designers like being creative, there's always going to be a need um, to write something new. So our widget framework cannot do it all. The, the other reason, of course, is not just out of necessity, but out of geek pride. Engineers like taking a fresh look at a widget and, and rebuilding it from scratch. There's always this notion of, I can do it better, I can do it lighter, I can do it faster, I can do it um, with better, a better feature set. And so um, we really want to encourage the style of development, not necessarily um, s suppress the style of development. And so there's lots of good reasons for custom widget development. And we want to try to be able to foster that with YUI3. And so we know that our widget framework will not have everything. And we know that there's no definitive solutions. There's no definitive most accessible tab view. Um, the needs uh, will continue to emerge as are the solutions for those needs. And so custom widget development will always be valuable and will always be necessary. So for YUI3, what we want to do is really not only provide an accessible widget framework, but we want to be able to foster um, designing accessible widgets by building a set of utilities that are also very focused on accessibility so that we can make custom widget development easier. Um, we also want to provide this modular widget architecture because we think that that'll be valuable because a lot of times making a widget more accessible doesn't necessarily mean a rewrite of the widget from the ground up. It means actually supplementing that widget with new functionality. And that's where our um, class extension and plugin model really becomes valuable because perhaps making a more accessible tab view just re requires um, the creation of a tab view plugin that adds even more keyboard support or new uh, navigational patterns for um, navigating the widget. Um, so again, it doesn't necessarily require rewriting the widget, but maybe just supplementing the widget with new functionality to make it even more accessible. So both models of custom widget development are completely valid, and we want to be able to support both going forward with YUI3. So the final lesson we've learned, lesson eight, is evangelizing best practices is really critical. So no matter how uh, great a job we do at making um, a really, really accessible widget, uh, really, really accessible YUI3 widget in, uh, infrastructure, as well as providing core utilities. What we need to let users know is that 
using YUI in your page alone does not make your site accessible because there are so many other things that can take in, that need to be taken into consideration from the big picture. So um, evangelizing um, best practices for accessibility as they range outside of the widget scope is really important. And so that's one of the things that we try to do at Yahoo is evangelize best practices for accessibility. And we try to do that also um, outside of the company as well. And this is really important because um, people find unintended use for unintended uses for products all the time. And that's highlighted by this slide where someone has used post-it notes as a means of decorating a lamp. And as engineers, you could build the most accessible um, DHML menu, for example. But because DHML is so mutable, someone is easily able to take that and either make something that's even more accessible or actually hamper, it, hamper it, its accessibility in some ways. And so developers are no exception to this rule of products being used for unintended unintended purposes. And so um, the more we educate developers about really good design patterns for accessibility, the more we can help encourage developers to do something that's really great for accessibility as opposed to something that um, actually works against a widget's accessibility. And so again, uh, developer evangelism and education is, is something that we really take seriously here at Yahoo, and we try to do a lot um, in the community as well. Because there are many uh, really great front-end engineers that just don't have much experience with accessibility. And there are many new developers who are just trying to get the basics down. And so we need to teach developers at all different levels. And we need to teach developers the, the complete story of accessibility and how it fits together just beyond the scope of a given widget. And so to further help that cause, we have a, an accessibility category of YUI blog. Again, we teach classes. Um, we're going to be drafting a set of widget development guidelines that'll be part of the YUI3 site. We're also going to have as many accessibility-focused examples of our widgets as possible um, in our YUI3 examples gallery. We also try to contribute those examples back to other um, places on the web, such as codetalks.org, where we know that people go to to look for examples of uh, how to build accessible widgets. And so, to sum up, you know, DHML widgets are always very mutable. And so it makes it very easy to implement both good and bad user interfaces. And so um, developer education is really the key to helping developers do, um, do things that are more accessible as opposed to less accessible. And so I'd like to really try to incentivize anyone out there who really knows a lot of it about accessibility to you know, contribute to a project if you're not already doing so or start a new one. Um, to blog about solutions that you found that are great for accessibility to contribute back to the community in that way. There's also tons of opportunities that you can contribute to through codetalks.org. You can submit test cases, examples, um, and other findings that you've uh, come across with respect to accessibilities. And the other way you can um, really get involved as a developer who's interested in accessibility is actually to file bugs with the browser manufacturers and uh, AT vendors, and that's a tremendous way to make things better for everybody, both developers and users. And so this is a complete set of lessons learned. Um, it's really important to build on existing best practices. Don't forget that the browser is a vast source of incompatibility, pain, and misery. Um, when it comes to accessibility, that new skills are going to be required that you don't already have. Um, that living up to the desktop is a difficult challenge. Um, but don't forget that the web is not the desktop, and so don't forget to really take into consideration what's right for the web when you're developing your widgets. Um, we also remember, of course, that our widget framework won't be able to do it all, and so it's really important to foster as much as we can um, new widget development through the set of um, accessibility-minded utilities in YUI3, as well as the ability to extend our widgets in YUI3 with enhancements to uh, accessible functionality. And lastly, to evangelize best practices. And so we realize um, the burden on developers. And for YUI3, we're really trying to help shoulder that burden as much as we can with respect to accessibility. Um, because we know that we, as YUI, can help developers because we have time and resources uh, with respect to accessibility that a lot, of developer, a lot of developers out in the field just don't have, for example, um, access to a lab for doing testing with various assistive technology, or access to users who have uh, who 
users who are disabled that we can test with. So we can do user testing and we can test with assistive technology, things that not all users have access to. Um, we also have the ability to help users directly um, as members of the YUI team because we have the advantage of scale. Any accessibility enhancements that we make to YUI that make it back into Yahoo benefit uh, users across the web at a tremendous scale. And so, in short, we know the opportunity to get this right is huge, and we know that getting there will not necessarily be easy because of all of the challenges that I've talked about in this talk. But we also recognize that there will always be new challenges and solutions, and that those solutions are likely to come outside of Yahoo, and so we want to provide, as I said earlier, a means of empowering developers through the use of the widget framework, again, through utilities that make custom widget development easier. And so um, we want to really foster that concept of a thousand flowers blooming. And so that concludes the talk. Again, my name is Todd Klutz. Um, my email is klutz at yahoo-inc. And you can also follow me on Twitter. My handle is Todd Klutz. Thank you for coming. <laughs>